<laughs> so uh, basically, um, I'll tell you about myself. Uh, originally from Detroit, uh, currently based in Lansing, Michigan. Um, in Detroit, I went to Henry Ford High School. Returned back there to coach basketball as well as I played there. And uh, I'll tell you more about the other things too. I also went into corporate America along with being an appointee of Governor Grant home. I was a lobbyist for Walmart, the largest corporation in the world and traveled the country as their public affairs and government relations manager and did a lot with philanthropy. But uh, just going forward, let's get right to the crux of what we have today. Today I want to talk to you about education, sports, and charity. And if you can't remember that, just remember that ESC key that's on your keyboard. Education, sports, and charity. And just like the escape key, with education, sports, and charity, you can escape from any scenario you're in. But that ESC also stands for something else. It stands for ego, struggle, and change, which is going to be re very relative to your life now and in the coming future. Okay? There was a study done by David Horton. It stated that many community college student athletes view academic success as remaining eligible and meeting the minimum requirement to be able to continue their athletic careers at a four-year institution. I hear the discussion about the progress reports and all that. Now, many of you may not think that way, but many of you may think that way. And I'm here to tell you that we really want to focus on that mindset of not just worried about the minimum requirement as it relates to your future and your success. One of the people in my book, uh, Jimmy King uh, of the Fab Five, and he said some really great things. Jimmy said, I don't think people realize how short an athletic career can be, even if you're blessed to have one. He also went on to say, you will have another 60 years of your life what are you going to do with that? Now, no matter what's going on, you're going to come back, and if you play and go to the next level, there's still going to be time. You have to think about that career beyond right now. And lastly, one great thing Jimmy stated was we were more than basketball players. And when he said we, he was referring to the Fab Five and all the people that he played with. So, I like this quote right here, and I think it's very relevant for right now. Life is pleasant, death is peaceful, it's the transition that's troublesome. I'll say that again. Life is pleasant. Death is peaceful. It's the transition that's troublesome. Now, I'm also a motivational speaker. I've traveled the country with that, and I'm doing some other things. I'll let these guys get seated. Hey, guys. If, you, if your schedule doesn't interfere with this, we start right at 1 o'clock. One, not 1 of 5, 1 of 5. Okay? All right. Okay. Thank you. Again, life is pleasant, death is peaceful, it's the transition that's troublesome. So I'm not here to be a dream killer by any means, but it's my job to be a dream clarifier, a dream clarifier that is. The question is, what are you going to do when the cheering stops? You're at this point in your life, just like Jimmy said in the earlier slide, that many of you may go on to the next level, four-year institution to play your sport of choice, or better yet, we can all close our eyes and think about what if we all achieved our professional sport goal. Now think about that. You go on to that goal that you have, but then when you're done after another decade, then what? I think the problem we have, we get tunnel vision when it comes to our goals, and all we think about is I want to make this goal, I want to reach this goal, I want to reach this goal. But then when you get to that goal, the question is now what? If you ever want to test that, wait till you ride down the highway and you see that $60 million Powerball. And you say, man, if I want that, I'll get this and I'll get that. But really think about that. After you win and after you tear the car lot up and get every car you want and all that stuff, you're going to be relatively young. What are you going to do with your life? And it's those type of moments that help you find out what your passion is. So I really want you to start thinking, what's going to happen when this change comes? This change is coming. Whether it's in the next year, two years, four years, or with a professional career, eventually the change is going to come. Now you can either go backwards, like the first slide, and not have focus on your academics, so when that change comes, you don't have anything to transition to, or you can start thinking forward, white. Forward thinking. What is my future going to hold? What things do I need to have to get in control? Another word I talked about that's going to be very important, ego. Right? Ego is a great thing and also a bad thing. You know, Muhammad Ali says, I'm the greatest. And ego has been a great thing for you in your life so far. Because if it wasn't for your ego, you wouldn't be where you are. If you didn't believe in yourself, the coach wouldn't believe in you. If you didn't believe you could make the play, you probably wouldn't make the play. But what's going to happen to those eventually, that ego is going to cause you a problem because the ego is wrapped up in your identity. Right now, if someone asks you, you know, what's your name and what do you do, you're going to say, hey, I'm Lindsay, I'm a basketball player. 
I'm Lindsay, I play, I play baseball, which is fine and true. But in my book, I did some research and I found out that when these students were playing their last season on campus, the transition was terrible. Because no one comes to you when the last shot is shot, the last buzzer goes off, that last inning, no one's in the dugout saying, hey, I'm here to help you transition to your career after sports. And it is inevitable. It's going to happen. There's another change, too. Your physical change. Your bodies. Right now, you guys may have two a days. You're working out. You're staying healthy. Hitting the weight room. All your friends are playing the sport. You're in great shape. But when you finish this process, whether it's here, for your institution, or after a professional career, you got to pay for that YMCA membership. Okay? You got to get up and go work out. You got to work that into your regular, everyday life. And that's a tough thing because now your body, you're not this svelte, you know, in shape person that you were in your college days. So all those things have a major, major impact, and all those things lead to a major, major struggle. I was just on the radio yesterday in Lansing with the Big Show, and we had Ken Dallafor. He's a former NFL player, and he talked about that big jump off point when the cheering stops. It's going to happen, and you need to prepare yourself for it. Is it a struggle? Definitely it is. But I want to talk to you about struggle and how you want to embrace that. I'll give you my personal story. It won't even relate to sports. Now, I was an athlete, coached basketball, but my senior year in high school, I was class president, senior class president, student council president, youth governor of the state of Michigan. I had nothing but the highest hopes for my career as a politician. High school, all those great things would happen. I went on to Morehouse College in Atlanta, first person in my family to go away to college. It was a great dream. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. went there. They referred to it as the Black Harvard, but it cost $20,000 a year for me to attend. And I'm first generation college. Single parent household, and I never forget that fateful night when I came back home to Detroit in that summer. My mother sat me down outside in that summer breeze and said, Son, I can't afford to send you back. It was $20,000. That makes perfect sense. My world was crushed because that was my identity. I'm Lindsay. I'm a Morehouse man. I was wrapped up into that. However, I told you about the other word, which is change. And I was able to make a change because when I was in high school, even though I had already been accepted into Morehouse, my life skills and truck structure. Dr. Shirley Jennifer, she's since passed. She said, always have a backup school, just like you want to always have a backup plan. And that day, I remember signing up at on the spot admissions for Western Michigan University. When then I was already accepted at the Morehouse, so I didn't have to apply, but I said, I'll follow her advice. Follow the wisdom of these people who are here, who've been through what you've gone through, and they're trying to tell you. I follow her advice, and thank goodness, because all I had to do was make a phone call, <laughs> and I transferred to Western Michigan University. And what I thought was an academic Nightmare ended up being a dream come true. I befriended the president of the university who since passed, Dr. Dieter Henneke. I became vice president of the NAACP. I joined my beloved fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. I got an internship in Congress in Washington, D.C., a paid internship, and I also interned with the office of Mayor Dennis Archer. We have a relationship to this day. When I call him, email him, he's picking up the phone, he's calling right back. But all that came when I thought I was going to be going through a nightmare, but I was willing to make the change, and I want you guys to think about that, too. In life, it's not about what happens to you, but how you respond to it. Where are my golfers at? Who plays golf? OK, it's always a few. That's great. More of you guys start playing, too. I was on a par three last year. Not this one. This is too nice. I was on a par three. And I uh, hit my first shot off, boom, off to the left, into the trees. I thought the hole was done. But as in life, folks, good breaks, bad breaks, it's all the same. The ball hit the tree, popped back into play, Two more shots, I'm putting for par. So my response to you is not about what happens, but how you respond to it. Helen Keller. Helen Keller was the first blind and deaf woman to graduate from college. She was an author and an actress. You think your classes are tough. Just imagine. Okay? She said character cannot be developed in ease and quiet. Only through experience of trial and suffering can the soul be strengthened, vision inspired. Vision clear, ambition inspiring, success achieved. I'll read again. Character cannot be developed in ease and quiet. Only through experience of trial and suffering can the soul be strengthened. Vision clear, ambition inspired, and success achieved. Winston Churchill, he's a former British Chancellor. He said, kites rise highest against the wind, not with it. Kites rise highest against the wind, not with it. So you need to think about embracing whatever your struggle may be whether it's your athletic struggle you're having, whether it's your personal struggle, or going forward in your professional life, whatever your professional struggle is going to be, it's always going to be a struggle and a challenge. And the better you off you are when you embrace it. Where there is no struggle, there is no strength. That's Oprah Winfrey. 
talk about somebody who had a struggle. She grew up with a terrible childhood. But she's going on to become what? Probably the most influential woman in the world, if not person, okay? You know this guy right here, right? Remember, I'm taking my talents to South Beach. All the fallout that came because of that. Remember all those other things that took place after he finally went down there and said, we're going to win all these championships, and they came up short that first season. How bad they talked about him. How he didn't even want to come outside. But he'll tell you himself, he embraced that struggle, and he made some personal changes. He embraced it and made those personal changes inside. And what did the next season bring? Him being unstoppable, living up to his potential and beyond. I love the story of the Phoenix. Great story. Phoenix is a mythical creature, ancient Egyptian or Greek history, whatever you want to follow. And the sun god Apollo thought so highly of it, it would stop and listen to the Phoenix when it would sing a song. It was so beautiful. And it lived between 500 and 12,000 years. But when the Phoenix life was near the end, it would build a nest in the mountains. And it would go to that nest and it would set itself on fire. It would allow itself to be consumed by those flames. Now what would happen is after the phoenix would burn, it would eventually rise from the ashes. And that's what I want to talk to you guys about right now. Whatever struggle, whatever challenge, whatever this next transition brings you, being able to be like a phoenix, be like LeBron, be like Oprah, and rise from the ashes of your situation going forward. Now let me tell you about my personal story, okay? I said I was in corporate America and was doing great. And not to brag, but to give you some context, six-figure income, traveling the country, preparing to travel the world for this corporation. It was a great thing, but when my wife and I found out we were having our first child, I was having a daughter, I thought to myself, what am I gonna say when my daughter comes to me and say, Daddy, this is my dream and I wanna do it. I said, I can't expect my daughter to follow her passions and dreams if I'm not having the courage to do that myself. So I left the security of that corporation, I left all those things because I wanted to use my background in education as a teacher, in politics, corporate America, along with my passion for sports, coaching, and philanthropy. And by the way, Muhammad Ali is the only guy I let rub my head like that, just to let you know, too. <laughs> but I had to make that decision. I had to redefine who I was. I had to make that change. I couldn't let my ego or my struggle stop me from making that change. And I couldn't let the identity I had of being a corporate guy stop me from stepping out on my own. And that's what I want you guys to think about going forward. Now, my passion is philanthropy. And there are many definitions for philanthropy, but one is the spirit of active goodwill towards others as demonstrated in efforts to promote their welfare. It's just giving back, guys. That's all it is, it's giving back. Stephanie Sandler, the Giving Back Fund, she's one of the people I interviewed for the book. The Giving Back Fund, they uh, advise and consult athletes and entertainers to their foundation. They have an excellent summit that happens every year. I am uh, try to always attend. Now, she summed up what I was thinking in one of the conversations we had. She said, if professional athletes and entertainers can convince people to buy sneakers and perfume by the truckload, why not use that same power to promote charitable giving? Now let's go back through this. Not professional athletes, if the athletes at Henry Ford Community College can convince people to come to their games, read the box scores, do all these things, why can't you guys use that to influence charity? You guys have a following, we'll talk more about that. Where did my idea for the book come from? I was at the 2011 Michigan High School Athletic Association's Boys Basketball State Championship. And I was there, and I was sitting around, and I was watching the guys play, and the swagger these players had. And I'm not just talking about the guys, it's the young ladies as well. They had NBA swagger. And I said to myself, wow, I'm sitting there, and there was a group of guys sitting around me, and they knew everything about the players. They knew where they went to high school at, of course, where they were going to college at, knew things about their family. There was a diverse group of men behind me. That game was over. I get up, I leave, go to another part of the arena. Same thing, they knew everything about the players. And as I said, I was in corporate America at the time. I had about $3 million in foundation money. I was spread throughout the country and also with some professional athletes. And I thought, wow, if these players had access to the resources that I have, what kind of impact could they make? Because at the end of the day, you are the center of your circle of influence. People know who you are, they look up to you. The scrutiny you get from high school athlete of the week just this morning, I looked at the Free Press News, and you see the pro players, but right above that, you see the amateur players. So-and-so scored this, so-and-so scored that. And everybody's reading that and following you and doing all these things. So the scrutiny and attention you get is like a professional athlete. So what I'm talking about is you want to think about how you can use that to promote charity to the next level. This is going to be good for you because at the end of the day, your ego is still a part of this equation. And that's just human nature. It's not just you. You're not the first one who had an ego issue with your transition. 
That's human nature. We all want to give a great elevated pitch. Lindsay, what are you doing now? I'm doing this, I'm doing this, and I'm doing that. We all want to say something great. But with charity and philanthropy, you can use your influence and your platform to be able to not only help yourself because you have something that you're involved in that's wonderful, but you're going to help that organization. Unlike we say, it was the Book and Philanthropic Project. This is the cover of the book. And the Book and Philanthropic Project encourages athletes not to use sports to promote themselves. I go to middle schools, high schools, and of course, colleges to talk about this program. It's a free program, we get sponsor support. And I'm happy to say, as I was telling Mr. Washington and Mrs. Taylor earlier, again, thank you for having me here too, that uh, we just received a federal grant for student athletes in the Detroit Public Schools to promote health and nutrition. So that means the people who had this grant, when I came to them with my idea, they saw the influence that middle school athletes can have, and they decided to give me a grant. So imagine the impact collegiate level athletes can have. If a middle school athlete can influence their peers, their family, to go on to healthy lifestyles, imagine the impact you guys can have too. And the book also talks about the 10 steps of philanthropy. It shows how you become a philanthropist by using technology and social media. Technology and social media, there's never been a generation like this before that's so ingrained in social media. You guys are probably the only generation that all of your technical or life that you've been on the computer, you've been involved with Facebook, Twitter, or some strong form of social media. Many of us in the room, not today, that I said we had to transition into that. I even heard you guys talking about who got the Valentine text going on? What was that about? All right, yeah. Okay, that's another thing. So technology, <laughs> sports, and philanthropy. Yeah, I heard that. Anybody know this guy right here? And, not, and Dominic Sue, I had the pleasure to work with his uh, foundation, uh, do some consulting with him, his family. It was a great time. Uh, he had a tweet up. Anyone heard of a tweet up? Okay, a tweet up is any type of event that's driven by social media. And he broke the Guinness Book of World Records at the University of Nebraska, his alma mater, with the tweet up. So when he came to Detroit, uh, his family, the foundation came to me, they wanted us to help out with having a tweet up to break his own record in Detroit. Now this is during the season that the lockout was taking place. And we were putting things together, we were getting ready to make it happen, and the day before the event, the lockout ended. So he had to go back to work, thus we couldn't do it. However, this is an opportunity where he was using social media to promote charitable giving, because he was going to do some great things with his charity. So that lets you know the impact it can have, and you guys are so ingrained with it. It's like second nature to you. So he couldn't make it, but we had another guy group show up. And this is Jalen Rose, you all know him, philanthropist. ESPN analyst, former NBA player, and member of the Fab Five, but what I'm so proud about Jalen is his Jalen Rose Leadership Academy. I had an opportunity to involve him and get him in the book, and it was a great time, and I'll talk to you more about that after these moments. Jalen said, philanthropy is not about money. It's about time and energy and resources and caring about somebody who is not as fortunate and in need at the time. Now, I know today some refund checks may have come back, so money is a different kind of subject right now. But at the end of the day, Respectfully, you guys aren't in that position. You don't have any money. And no one's mad at you for that. You're college students. You're not supposed to have money. Something's wrong. But know that it's not about the money right now. It's your time. It's showing up somewhere. It's sitting across from that kid who's looking at you with your uniform on and someone saying, you play basketball on the next level? You play baseball on the next level? That right there can change a kid's life. It's not about the money because you don't have a check to write. And to be honest, when Hurricane Katrina took place and Kenny Smith organized all the professional <coughs> athletes to give, he wouldn't let them come with someone else. He said, you have to bring the money yourself. Which meant, I don't want your handler or someone to write a check. No, I need you to come because sometimes your time and presence is more important. Let somebody you know pass and someone in their family pass. And you send a check. What's going to be more, more important? You sending the check or you showing up at the funeral and saying, I'm sorry to hear about your loss. You think about that. So at this point, you cannot use the fact that I don't have the money to stop you from doing some great things. Also, Jalen went on to say, philanthropy comes from the heart. It has a lot to do with your upbringing, staying grounded, staying humble, and not being willing to forget about those in fight and the plight you left behind. We all know no matter where you guys went to school at, there's some kids who are just so needy, even adults, to be able to see you come back. Now, there is a reality about your own personal safety based on how the world is right now, but nothing stops you from going back to your school. You can say, I don't like the teacher there. It doesn't matter. It's not about them. It's not about you. It's about this other kid looking up to you, seeing you coming back. Who knows what kind of impact that had when someone came back to your school. Other book contributors. We have former and current NFL players, T.J. Duckett, Michigan State. T.J.'s on the very end right there with the big beard, and that's for significant reasons. T.J. grows his beard out every year, and he cuts it off for charity. Right there is Nikki Higgins. Nikki had and I had the discussion in the book about ego and whatnot. Right here is Nick Vandenbosch. Nick has a great story. Nick uh, went on 
to uh, play at Albion College, he played football, and him and his best friend from the Muskegon area, they realized that, wow, there's never been an opportunity for us to showcase our football skills in the Muskegon area. So they took that idea they had in college, just like many of you talk all the time about what you want to do. They took that idea, and they formed the Muskegon All-Star Classic. So going into their second year now, they bring teams from all over the Muskegon area and had this huge, huge event at Mona Shores is Beautiful. They brought me up last year. I was able to do some color commentary, and they gave away scholarships. But this all came from two guys who were playing a sport just like you folks are right now, saying this is a plan we have. And right here is Mike Martin. Mike plays for the Tennessee Titans, but Mike and I met when he was at University of Michigan. Mike was involved in philanthropy in college. He was even involved in philanthropy in high school. And Mike is the one who said it's those uh, you know, press days at the big house when everyone was all around him with all those microphones that he makes a point to break away from them and find that kid sitting in the corner and walk over to him and sit and talk to him. You think that kid's going to forget about that? You think that kid's going to forget that impact that it had? For the ladies, I haven't got about you guys as well. Former MSU professional basketball player, Lauren H. She's in the book. This is Lauren right here, Draymond Green and Dr. Poachin at Michigan State. Lauren was a high school basketball champion, Waverly High School in the Lansing area. Went on to Michigan State, uh, then went on overseas and played in Denmark. But Lauren didn't just stop there. She made the change. She made the transition. Lauren said, well, you know, I love fashion. So she started her own fashion line, the Lady H Fashion Line. And she also started the Hidden Key Foundation, where they focus on specific cures towards cancer. And they're the only sports oriented foundation on MSU's campus working with MSU looking at cancer research. Very unique. So it doesn't stop, guys. And I'll give you some more examples. Camilla Nelson. Camilla is the founder of Uplift Athletics. She ran track at Renaissance High School and Michigan State. Now, you don't hear Camilla's name because she didn't go on to play professional sports, but she had an idea. And she created this organization for student athletes in the Detroit public schools and beyond that focus on community outreach, personal development, academic enrichment, and athletic excellence. So there is no excuse why you can't take these ideas you have and merge it and make something great happen. Horatio Williams, that's the connection that Mr. Washington and I have. Horatio had uh, a great college career that was cut short by a tragic accident, but he didn't let that stop him from giving back. He has the baseball showcase, which some of you guys may have heard about. He has scouts out there and some great opportunity for baseball players in the Metro Detroit area. He has a second chance game, which is awesome. He brings students together who didn't get recruited. He brings college coaches in from all over the country, and they do recruitment, and I can't tell you the number of scholarships that students have received after that. He also had the MLK basketball tournament just a few, week, few weeks ago, and to my knowledge, I couldn't make it down. And they said that was one of the best games that happened in high school history. Not recent, but history between Flint, Beecher, and Persia. Now, right here is at this facility that we're going to do the tweet up at. You see all these shoes? These are shoes he donated to Detroit Public Schools. These are shoes he donated to the team. Now, that's the one on the sports side, but his uniform drive is for kids to get uniforms at <coughs> their schools, ACT, SAT that Mr. Ruben Washington is involved in, uh, tutoring and life skills program. I do some work with myself. And here's a few things that Horatio said. He said, giving back is really the right thing to do, whether you're successful or not. We all say, well, when I get paid, then I'm going to do this. No, it's not about that. There are different definitions for success, but you're a success right now. Think about how many of your classmates who didn't even make it to where you are right now. You guys are collegiate athletes. If that's not success, I don't know what is. Okay, so keep that in mind. Sometimes money is not knowledge. It's just a quick fix, so don't get caught up in the money. We're going to talk about that before we wrap up. So keep that in mind as well. And remember that regardless of your walk in life, you can reach back and help somebody. Don't think that because of where you're from that you can't have an influence or an impact on somebody. Because someone's always going to be looking up to you. Someone's always going to be uh, impressed by the things that you're doing. I'll tell you my personal situation about how everyone can make an impact. A couple years ago, <laughs> I wanted to play golf for my birthday. I'm going to play some golf. So I said, you know, the guys will get together. We're older now. We can do a little bit more work. We can do some charitable things. So I said, hey, we're going to play golf. And then when we're done, if we got some money left over, we'll write a check and make a donation. So I called my friend Dara Munson at Big Brothers Big Sisters. I said, Dar, I'm gonna play golf and when we're done, I'm just gonna send you a check and give you a heads up. She said, no, Lindsay, Arby's restaurant had been our sponsor and they pulled out. So we'll give you our golf out. So overnight, I went from just guys getting together to play golf to having a corporate golf out. We raised $10,000, $10,000. That's former NFL great Charlie Sanders, Hall of Famer as well. He came out to share some words of wisdom and we had that relationship because when I was in corporate America, I had supported his foundation. So it was nothing for me to pick up the phone and call him and have him come out. The world will make a way for you folks when you have a plan. It's 
starting today when you have that plan. These are the participants. And do know that acts of kindness are always repaid. Now, we don't want to do things for the point of just getting some stroking and someone say, you did a great job. But no matter what, it's going to come back. That's Dar right there thanking me. And I, I didn't do it for that reason. But although you don't do it for the praise, it's going to come. It got to the point where I would go to different places and functions and introduce myself. And someone would say, hey, you're that guy that did the golf island for Big Brother Big Sisters, right? So that wasn't my intent. But those are the things that are going to come when you're doing some good work. And the people you meet. This is when I was in corporate America. And uh, I had worked with Walmart, and we had gave $50,000 to the foundation of Jason Richardson. He has a man up for him. And I was able to go out to California doing an all-star game and uh, participate. Chris Tucker was one of the people involved. Funny guy, good guy. Uh, Camille Winbush from the Bernie Mac show, she was involved as well. And with philanthropy, it's fun. And the reality is that when you're doing philanthropic work, your interaction with these celebrities or whomever it may be is totally different. You're not a groupie coming up, hey, I want your autograph. They're just as impressed by the work you're doing as you may be by what they're doing. And we had a good time. Camille was fun. Chris was fun. Going back before, we had a great relationship. And I even have contact with some of their folks to this day. This is funny right here. This is Chris getting ready to speak. I looked down. He had a nice pair of gator shoes. I said, gator? That's like the trick. He said, man, my mama bought these. I mean, this is a funny guy all the way around. And Latoya Luckett, formerly a Destiny Child. She was involved. We were able to have some great interaction. But you build a different kind of relationship when you're doing philanthropic work. Now, before I want to wrap up, if you don't remember anything, I really want us to focus on this right here. The Wealth Cure. This is a book that's written by Hill Harper from CSI and all those things. And in the book, he talks about advice for avoiding the predicaments that pile up when we obsess about material gain. Now listen, I'll be the last one to tell you not to make your money, okay? I did it. I went to corporate America, and I did it for the sake of being driven by the money I was going to make, the security was going to bring, and all the great things I wanted to do with it. Now, I wouldn't tell you not to be about that. However, do know this. Benjamin Franklin said that money never made a man or woman happy, yet, nor will it. The more a man has, the more he wants. Instead of filling a vacuum, it makes one. And let me be a personal testament. The money was great, but you'll get to that point, ladies and gentlemen, where you're going to hit that wall, where if you're not following your passion, if you're not doing what you're truly committed to do, the money won't matter. Now, many of you may say right now, man, whatever, I learned to live with it. And you may. But believe me, there comes a time in life and the other adults in the room can tell you. But you're going to look back at your life and you say, did I do all that I really want to do? And I'm not telling you that. And here's the last thing. If you're passionate about something, it's going to make money for itself if you're really passionate. <laughs> so what's on your wealth factor list? I'll tell you what's on my list. What's important to me that doesn't require money? I can pose that question. I'm sure we all say your relationship with God, at least you should. Relationship with my family, being healthy, those are fine. But I want you to dig a little deeper and really think to yourself, what are some things that are important to you that don't require money? One thing for me is being able to make a connection with anyone I need to. From a politician, the president, whomever, I use Jalen Rose, for example. I didn't know Jalen prior to the book. We had been at an event together and hung out, but it wasn't like that. So when I had to go to him about being in my book, because he was the person I wanted to get involved, I went to his golf outing. I see him, I walk up to him, I say, hey, Jalen, I got a book about athletes and charity, I want you to be in. He's like, man, no problem, man, just call me. I'm like, man, I don't have your number out. You know, what do you mean, just call me, right? So I'm out at the golf outing, right? I'm on the opposite uh, hole, we're riding, and he's coming back. I'm like, well, you know, I'll catch him when he gets to the clubhouse. Because I was right behind him, you know, going. I get in the clubhouse, I see his mom. I said, where's Jalen at? Oh, Jalen got on the red eye. He had to go back to California. We can shoot the ESPN out there. Oh, man, but fortunately, I was able to connect with some of his folks. We made some connections, and a few days later, my phone rings. Hello, this is Jalen Rose. And we talked for more than an hour at the time. The documentary on the Five Five just came out, and he talked about a whole lot of stuff that wasn't in the documentary about Duke and all that, but it was great. But my point being is those are things that are important to me. Also, being able to keep my head up no matter what situation I'm in. There are simple things, but you need to think about that. And when you can connect to what's important to you that doesn't require money, you're going to find your passion. And believe me, you'll be rich beyond your years when that happens. So last, embrace the struggle, ladies and gentlemen. Someone once told me you're either in a storm, coming out of a storm, or getting ready to go into another. I don't mean to sound more, but a negative, thus is the cycle of life. But if you're embracing your struggle every time, all the time, all these are going to do are be things to help you do better. You must believe you can make an impact. If you don't believe you can make an impact, no one else should believe you will. You must believe that you can have some influence to do something to change the course of things. And this is a quote by Mahatma Gandhi. You must plant seeds and grow trees 
under which shade you will never sit. I'll say that again as the tree is off to the side. You must plant seeds to grow trees under which shade you will never sit. What does that mean? You have to be willing to do something that's not going to impact you. You have to be willing to do something that you won't see the benefit of. You have to be of that mindset of what can you do that's going to help maybe even a generation. And as soon as you embrace those things, you'll be living a life of freedom that you never, never believed of. And last, you are our society's unlikely saviors. You're it, guys. You're the people everyone's looking up to. And unfortunately, so many athletes take this power and influence that they have, and they run into the ground. But so few, at least known, are taking this platform they have and using it for a great thing. Because people are going to always want to know, what was it like playing college basketball? What was it like playing golf? Playing baseball? What was it like? All these things. You're going to always make a connection. And I'll say this finally. Think about it. They say, what are the two things you shouldn't talk about when you meet someone, sports, excuse me, religion, and politics? But the thing you can always talk about is the weather and sports. So you guys are going to always have a conversation. I'm really proud of you. I expect nothing but great things from you. Thank you for having me here, and I love to answer any questions. Thanks. I'd like to say this on Twitter, a Huddleston group. Uh, both of these, you follow me. There's a morning tweet I put out about 3, 4 a.m., People call it inspirational, so uh, if you want to get something from that, you can get that from me. So thanks again. If you have any questions, I'd love to answer any questions you guys may have. Anything? It's got a long drive back, man. I'm going back to Lansing. So give me one of questions. Can you go back to your uh, slide? Absolutely. Okay. Here. Third one down. Yeah, you mentioned Mahatma Gandhi. Could you let the guys know? Mahatma Gandhi. Matter of fact, shoot for the does anyone know who Mahatma Gandhi is in there? Who is he? And him? He's like a... Loud, please. But yeah. I mean, it's hard to describe you. I mean, he's in from India, right? Yes. And uh, he's known for fasting. He was an activist. And you on, what's your name? Social and Andrew. Andrew, good job. He was an activist. And I got a great story to tell about Mahatma Gandhi, how it affected my life personally. As I said, I just got a grant recently uh, to work in Detroit Public School to help uh, student athletes uh, increase, decrease obesity and things like that. And there was a quote that was very interesting. Okay, Mahatma Gandhi was a lawyer, he was an activist. He inspired Dr. King. So that's giving you the idea of the gravity and the impact that he had. So during his time in India, just like during the times of slavery, when cotton was the industry, there was a big issue and controversy going on during that time, and sugar was that same type of commodity. Can you guys follow what I'm saying? You got cotton and sugar. So it was kind of controversial to be involved with sugar. So there was a mother who went to Mr. Gandhi because he was a person of influence and she took her son. And she said, Gandhi, please, please tell my son to stop eating sugar. He said, I cannot do that now. He said, bring your son back in two months and I'll tell him. <coughs> so why can't you tell him right now? He said, bring him back in two months. Two months ago, come back, she brings her son. She says, uh, can you please tell him to stop eating sugar? He looks at the young man and says, son, do as your mother says. Stop eating sugar. She said, why couldn't you say that two months ago? <clears throat> he said, because two months ago, I was eating sugar. So he knew that he couldn't ask someone to do something he wouldn't do himself. So I'm glad you brought that up. You got to start thinking like this right now. You got to start being living examples of the things that you want to be. Mahatma Gandhi also said, you must be the change you want to see in the world. You want things to change. You want gun violence to decrease. You want, you know, uh, uh, violence overall to decrease. You want all these things to happen. Well, what kind of change are you going to make? You guys have a platform. If you start thinking like that now, it's going to better serve you. Because all these things you're doing with sports, my goodness, you are disciplined. You know about getting up early. You know about making the commitment. These things are going to trans over, transition over to the professional world. I know some CEOs, all they want is athletes. That's all they want to hire is athletes. Not only because they can relate to them and all that, but they know that there's a discipline in there. So don't let your dream stop right now. If I don't make it to the next level, I'm done. No, that's part of life. And like I said before, even if you make it to the next level, you only got 20, 30 years old, and you're done. It's a wrap no matter what you're trying to do. You know. So you guys start thinking about, okay, what's my transition going to be? And lastly, if you make it to the next level, and you're at 30 years old, and you're done. Now, I'm 36. So I'll be 37 in a few months. Okay. If I was all about a sport, you need to realize that your second job, your second career, is going to be more important than your first. LeBron's second career, Ray Lewis's second career, you know, A-Rod's second career is going to be more important than his first because he's living out all that time now. 
And those may be some athletes who are multi, multi, multi millionaires. So you can say, oh, well, they can manage their money, they can work, but money's not everything. Keep that in mind. Any more questions? Yes, sir. What's your name? Uh, ben. Ben. What's your autograph collection like? You know what? I feel like I would have a lot of autographs. You know what? It's a very good question, Ben. Uh, I don't ask for autographs. You know what I do? I ask That's for advice. Flexible. I ask for advice. No, I've had many opportunities. I met Bill <laughs> Lambert. This is when I was with Governor Granholm's office. He was in and he was brought the uh, shop in and whatnot. That's another story. Uh, we'll talk about that later. I'll count. But anyway, my wife's going to ask me what I was talking about. I got in trouble now. Anyway, my point being is I went to him. I said at the time I was playing in the charity game uh, with uh, you know people at the governor's office. And they were getting mad at me because I was so competitive. I'm like, you know, I'm just competitive. I'm not trying to go out like that. So I asked Bill and Bill, I said, man, you know, what's the problem, man, with being so competitive? You know what he said? He said, everyone hates a winner. Everyone hates a winner is what he told me. And that's the original bad boy. So that's an example. Another thing that happened is that a few years ago, about 2007, I blew out my ACL. I had a meniscus tear, then I blew out my ACL, so I had to back off the hoops a little bit. I was traveling through Memphis on my way to Arkansas. This is when I was with Walmart. I saw Scotty Pippen in the airport. Another example where it could have been an autograph session, but I'm saying, man, I love to hoop, but I'm getting all beat up. So I go to world renowned Scotty Pippen. I say, tell me, when should I stop playing? He said, when you lose the love. That's how it sounds. He said it like that. <laughs> but my point being is, that's what I got from the situation. So instead of autographs, I try to get something. Uh, last example, uh, 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 George plays for Ohio State, uh, a buddy, the running back. I was in Ohio and saw him, he was having dinner. And we had a conversation, and uh, I did get an autograph from him because my mother likes him, Eddie George. So I got that from moms, you know. And uh, I asked, you know, uh, what was going on? He said, well, I just finished school. And this is a perfect example. I'm glad we got the second this. He said, I just finished school. I said, oh, you got your undergrad? He said, no, I got my MBA. I said, oh, excuse me. He said, because I need to know what my money is doing. So this is a very wealthy individual. He could have all kinds of people, you know, taking care of his stuff, his cousin, Buki, and all those folks doing his business. But he wanted to get his MBA. He valued the education that much. Because think about it. He's still a young man. And he has business ventures and all these things going on. And he doesn't want to go down a bad route. So that's another example of how you want to take advantage of it. But you know what? I don't ask. And one thing about the autograph situation, at least for me, people always want to talk about themselves. So they'll be willing to give some information. So to take that information from these world-class athletes, people who have some great experience in the world, you know, you know, I, I think is invaluable. And what you'll find many times is their outlook is probably the same as yours. Same thing. They put their pants on one leg at a time. Yes, sir. I know you crunched the time. One of them. Do you have any information on internships that some of the young men might be looking for experience in an area that they would not only gain experience but get paid for that? Sure, yeah, sure, sure. I, I think I can definitely be a resource. For Mr. Washington, you can contact me when we're done. I'll get my card out. I have a plethora of resources, whether it's from the corporate world uh, to potential, you know, opportunities within the sports world, and based on what your interest is. We can work on finding that. So I, I appreciate you guys having me out. Thank you for your questions and all that, and good luck to you guys, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I just want to, I just really appreciate your comments. And I love what you talked about. Everybody has, student athletes have influence right now. Sure. They have. Do you all remember two weeks ago, and I just shared with you that the women's basketball team was doing the food drive at their game? Remember? I shared that with you all. Their goal was to raise 200 pounds of food. They also collected $100 to feed 300 pounds. Okay, 200 pounds of food. Yesterday, I was at my desk. I was reading from the National Association of Collegiate Directors of Athletics, so they sent out news of what's going on all over. Now, listen to this. This is how student athletes influence. We were happy. We wanted to collect 200 pounds of food. We did. Conference USA, that's a conference, an NCAA conference made up of about, what, 11, 12 schools in Conference USA, schools in Ohio, Illinois. Three times. They had a food drive. Okay, they challenged all 12 schools, student athletes at all 12 schools, food drive for one week period, for a one week period. Those students collected, listen to this, 33 tons of food just student athletes, and they were able to indicate, and they went to the food banks in each one of those cities, just like our, our food is going to Glinger's Food Bank. These were just student athletes, just like you all, but they did band together, all of their teams together, had one week. Can you imagine 33 tons of food? 
and they didn't do anything more but let people know, bring your can your donations to campus on such and such a day during this week. That's what an influence can do. And if they fed thousands and thousands and thousands of families throughout there, all the different cities that those schools are in. So, I mean, we were pleased we did that with women's basketball. And what I will challenge this group now, based on this presentation we had today, is for you all, and I'm asking the coaches and Mr. Washington to help, what do you want to do? What influence do you want to have in this community? What project do you want to work on? Is it hunger? Is it helping young people? Is it literacy? You, you baseball, men's basketball, women's basketball. What do you want to do to influence folks on this campus, in this community, in this greater community area? Because you can do it. You need to decide on a project and work together. And we're going to start making sure that you understand the influence you have and we're going to help you with that. But it can be hunger, it can be anything, but I'm going to you know, make sure you all, it's your idea, it's your choice, but you can influence. People need us on this campus and they need us in this community, and I'm challenging them based okay. on your presentation today. And we hope to report back to you okay. what we're doing to influence folks. And I want to thank you for, now this year we have a theme on our campus in our athletic department. This was a time to believe time at to Henry Ford Community College with the HSCC oh, great. Hawks. Oh, great. And we thank you for your I presentation it. Thank today. You. Thank you. And good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Whatever you guys come up with, I'll be willing to get involved and match it as it relates to getting you to the next level, promoting it. I mean, I'll be involved because I got this thing started and I'll be willing to help you guys go to the next level. And I have a high expectation from this group, so this won't be the last you hear of me, if that's okay. Absolutely. All right, great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right, great.